Those are important. Yeah. And get started. We have both uh, folks from Jefferson Health in Port Townsend and Olympic Medical Center and perhaps Jamestown also. So um, I'd, Dr. Kennedy, unless you have anything to say, I would invite Dr. Gordon to get started and introduce himself. Yeah, I'll just say welcome. I'm, I'm Scott Kennedy. I've got Dr. Yurata Duffy, our uh, chief of the hospitalist and chief, um, chief of medicine with us here today. We have participants uh, online as well. So thank, thank you, Dr. Gordon, for coming. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a big fan of y'all out there. I would say actually my other disclosure is perhaps Olympic Medical Center is probably the most beautifully positioned hospital I have ever seen. I can't imagine what it looks like out that cafeteria when the seas, seas are stormy, but uh, wow, that is beautiful out there. Um, so my name is Jed Gordon. Uh, I'm. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an interventional pulmonologist, which is a little bit of a nebulous term, but uh, I trained in pulmonary critical care at the University of Washington, and then I went on to Boston and did a year of interventional pulmonary, which, interestingly enough, the timing that I did it about 2005 coincides with the introduction of endobronchial ultrasound. And that's relevant because endobronchial ultrasound is really, I think, the tool that brought uh, medicine doctors, pulmonologists in particular, into the world of thoracic oncology. When I trained at the University of Washington, all of thoracic oncology essentially went to the thoracic surgeons. Uh, and now I think that uh, more and more uh, pulmonologists, interventional pulmonologists are getting in the world of thoracic oncology. Uh, and I think it's it's great. The timing for that is really interesting. So the topic that I chose to talk to you all about today is procedural palliative care and malignant pleural effusions. And, and, you know, I thought about this for a while. And at first, you know, I just wanted to show off and sort of say all the awesome stuff that we can do. And then I thought, well, that's really not really relevant to everybody. So I thought, what's the most common thing that we deal with? And one of my goals is to keep people in their communities. And one of the most common things that we deal with are actually pleural effusions and malignant pleural effusions. And so I thought we could spend the morning talking about that with only a minimal amount of showing off at the end with a couple of slides. And the reason that this is near and dear to my heart is that um, I am very fortunate that I received a large grant a number of years ago, and not only am I an interventional pulmonologist here in the Department of Thoracic Surgery at Swedish in Seattle, but I run something called uh, the uh, Center for Lung Research in the honor of Wayne Gittinger, which is a uh, large uh, research program, which is run by a uh, physician from South Africa, and we typically bring in students who are interested in health services uh, to come and do research with us for a year or two. And we've been uh, really successful at publishing uh, and, and, and getting out there. And our publishing goals and our research goals are early lung cancer detection through palliation. So I hope to continue our dialogue as we go forward in the area of early lung cancer detection and how we can work together on that, increasing access. Uh, but I wanted to spend some time today talking with the back end of those bookends on palliative care. Uh, and particularly malignant pleural effusion. If you have any questions, just sort of jump in at any time. And, and really what I wanted to start off is to talk to you about the pleural space, malignant pleural effusions. And again, like I said, I chose this topic because it's common. It is a major symptom driver for our patients. And it's really something that's reoccurring. Uh, and we need to find ways to keep people comfortable and keep them at home. So by way of background, this is the pleural space. This is uh, taken courtesy of our thoracic surgeons. And the way I describe this to patients is that really the lung is like going to the grocery store and getting your groceries in a double plastic bag. When people have pleural fluid, it's not in the lung, it's in between those two plastic bags. So on the left, you'll see a malignancy in the lung, but a pristine pleural space, smooth, very crisp. You can see the ribs. And on the right, what you'll see is a very uh, nodular, thickened pleural space, and that's the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura and the fluid there in between those two plastic bags with the visceral pleural coating the lung and the parietal pleura there on the wall 
And so you can see where this pleural fluid builds up. And I think it helps give patients an appreciation for why they have symptoms if they understand this simple analogy. And like I said, I chose this because it's fairly common. This is from the introduction of a paper that we wrote a number of years ago, which is actually how I'm going to organize this talk based on how we organize this paper in terms of a way to manage malignant pleural effusions. But it's fairly common, over 150,000 cases a year, and I suspect that number is low in terms of the reality. And it's common in lung cancer and breast cancer being the two most common malignancies associated with it. And it takes up almost 20%, nearly a quarter of all pleural effusions are malignant. And it can be the initial presentation. It's often recurrent. It leads to significant symptoms. And it's overall a major burden for those individuals that have it. So how do we manage it? Well, that's what I'm going to walk you through this morning, how to think about this and hopefully help you think about how you can develop systematic programs to manage it. Because that's really what my hope is at the end of this talk, is that you can begin to visualize how to manage these patients in a systematic fashion so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel for each individual. The guidelines have evolved slightly, but you can look over the last two decades here nearly that there's not a huge number of changes. At the beginning, the ATS, the American Thoracic Society, said that thoracentesis should be the initial intervention, and we'll talk about that, and that makes sense, and that for rapid reoccurrence of effusions that these need to be treated, uh, and that in the absence of stability, we, we may not need to, in the absence of symptoms, we may not need to do anything. But at the time, in 2000, pleuridesis, or essentially searing those two plastic bags together, was the modality of choice to manage this. If you fast forward to the most recent guidelines that were published in 2018, they echo many of the same themes, but they start to bring in some newer concepts. So number one, no intervention required for an asymptomatic patient. We can let people have pleural effusions as long as they're not symptomatic. A tunnel pleural catheter, and we'll use these words kind of interchangeably. IPC is an indwelling pleural catheter. TPC is a tunnel pleural catheter. Plurex is a brand name for a catheter. These are all the same things, and we'll talk about them. Or pleuridesis with talc less than five, uh, five grams. I'm sorry, that's actually a mistake. It's five grams. Uh, if the lung expands are both options. An IPC, if the lung does not expand, is really the best option. And really performing a large volume thoracentesis to assess symptoms uh, and really gauge the patient up front is the best way to start. And we'll talk about this because I know some of these things give people angst. But what I want to emphasize is the last line. None of the guidelines really take into account or acknowledge shared decision making and patient preference. There was a paper published by David Ost that said the guidelines say that after the initial diagnosis of a malignant pleural effusion, if it reaccumulates, patients should go on to a more definitive intervention like a tunnel pleural catheter or pleuridesis. But the reality is, is that that's not necessarily the desire of patients. Some of them like to come into clinic. They like to see me. They feel more comfortable with it. So all of what we do at the end of life, and in many cases in medicine, really requires, I think, strong shared decision making. So this is a term that we coined in a paper that we wrote a long time ago, but I call it procedural palliative care. And, and sometimes we think of those two terms as being in conflict with each other, but I think if we make sure that they meet certain standards, that they're not really in conflict. So the intervention should be rapid and effective at controlling the symptoms, regardless of the medical condition. The intervention should have a low associated morbidity and mortality. The intervention should require minimal follow-up, and the intervention should maximize independence, comfort, and quality of life. And if it's a procedure that gets that individual to these goals, then I think it's appropriate to do procedures, even if we're talking in the setting of palliation, hospice, and end of life. So what are our palliative options that we're going to go through? Well, there's essentially three, serial thoracentesis, tunnel pleural catheter, and there are several different brands, or pleuridesis. And as we go through each one of these, I hope that everyone can begin to think about how to operationalize 
a system for patients uh, out on the peninsula to get them through these so that they are optimally managed and live their best lives uh, with this problem. So let's start. So patient has a symptomatic pleural effusion. Patient has cancer. Here's a picture and I'll end with what happened with this individual. This is a 51 year old male that I took care of who had pancreatic cancer. Great guy, great family, bilateral pleural effusions came into the hospital. They'd had some outpatient thoracentesis before they came to see me. So what's the survival for a patient like this and others? Well, there's some old data that shows that the survival for patients who have a malignant pleural effusion is, is really quite dismal. There's three different studies out here really outlining that survival is measured in months, usually less than six months. These papers are all retrospective. They're based on different factors and, and there's challenges with them. But the most recent guidelines that or the most recent standard that we use is something called the Lent score. This is something that helps us counsel patients, or at least in our own mind, begin to think about what we should do based on what we expect someone's survival may be. It's made up of four components, the LENT, L, LDH, E, ECOG, performance status, N, which is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, a little bit of a weird thing, and they use it in, uh, in England, which is where this uh, came from, and T, the tumor type. And what you can see at the bottom is that individuals who have low risk based on their Lent score, uh, moderate risk based on their Lent score, and high risk based on the Lent score fall into those number categories. And these are the survival curves. So those individuals in green who have <clears throat> high risk really have a very minimal survival. As their uh, risk becomes less, based on the Lent score, their survival becomes longer. And, and perhaps we need to think about different modalities for dealing with these individuals and counseling them. We've recently just done some work and we're trying to publish it, looking at sarcopenia in patients with malignant pleural effusions and survival. There are a lot of standards that people have looked at with dyspnea. I think really across the board, we know that survival is challenged in these individuals. And the Lent score does remain, I think, the standard of care, even though it is a little bit complicated. So how do we start? Patient comes in, they're identified with a pleural effusion. We start with a thoracentesis. This can be something that's done in the office. We do it in the office all the time. We've identified ourselves as a center. One of the reasons I think that this is important for individuals who are starting their practice in pulmonary or other to take this on, if you're looking for building volume, I can tell you that we probably do by volume about 700 uh, plural procedures a year. And by far, it's the largest volume procedure that we do. It's a common problem. It's a problem that's recurrent. It's a great way for people to build a practice and have a home for people to come to. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk about it with you today. So what should the thoracentesis do? I call it the decider. So they should all be done with ultrasound. That's the standard of care now. So we drain the fluid. Then I ask the question, does the patient have symptom relief? Does the lung expand? Is there evidence of lung entrapment? The way that we typically go about doing this in our practice is a patient comes in, we drain their pleural effusion, we send them home, we bring them back in one week or two weeks, and we ask these questions. Did you feel better? How long did you feel better for? Because it'll help us gauge how fast the pleural fluid reaccumulates. We ultrasound them to see if the fluids come back. We know whether or not the fluid has re the lung has re-expanded. So it's a, a very bedside, very simple way to both identify that they have a fluid collection, drain the fluid collection, resolve their symptoms, keep them out of the ER, keep them out of the hospital, all done at the bedside. So these are my complaints about thoracentesis. Often people stop thoracentesis too early. I hear when people go to interventional radiology or other places that they're told the maximum that someone can drain is a liter, some say a one and a half liters. These are old numbers that were never backed up by data. So people are concerned about re-expansion pulmonary edema, that's RPE. They're worried about cough, pain, and premature termination, I feel, affects palliative decision-making 
and it can minimize or even delay symptom relief. If someone doesn't get completely drained, they may leave the office short of breath. So we need to understand a little bit about what the data is and how we can feel safe with what we're doing. But the thoracentesis is one-stop shopping. People feel better right away. There's no more rewarding thing that I do than drain pleural fluid. So here's a patient, same patient. This is the same person. Drainage of the lung, particularly on the right side, you'll see that air fluid level. This is lung entrapment. This is a lung that doesn't expand. It's often uncomfortable because if you get an x-ray, radiology will read it as a pneumothorax. And that's why we really need to understand the difference between a pneumothorax, a dynamic process where air is leaving the lung and causing a potential physiologic problem, and lung entrapment where lung just doesn't re-expand to fill the space. Key differences, but radiographically, they're not going to call them. So lung entrapment versus trap lung, just two sort of slightly physiologically different entities. Lung entrapment is failure of the lung to re-expand because the visceral pleural thickening and or bronchial obstruction and trap lung is just scarring. The bottom line is, is that they're basically small lungs. And so you drain the fluid and you're left with a small lung that doesn't fill the space. So how can we sort of judge what we're going to do? If people are familiar with this number of not draining more than a liter or 1.5 liters, how do we give people confidence that that number is mythical and not something that's real? So David Feller Kopman and uh, Armin Ernst, these were the pulmonologists that I trained under when I was in Boston. Uh, David Feller Kopman uh, was initially at the Beth Israel in Boston and went to Johns Hopkins, is now chief of pulmonary at Dartmouth. Uh, he's really been one of the uh, leading uh, uh, authors and experts in plural space and plural pressures. And this is a, a paper that was published off data that we got when I was there um, that looked at manometry. So you look at change in plural pressure. So a drop of plural pressure of minus 20 centimeters of water and what symptoms were associated with it. And the only symptom that correlated with a drop in intrapleural pressure is chest pain, not cough, not shoulder pain, not throat discomfort, but chest pressure. And this most likely represents the fact that the lung doesn't have pain receptors, but the lining does. So I think of it as a rubber band. As the pleural fluid's being drained, you're stretching a rubber band that doesn't want to stretch, so people have chest pain. That's the point that I stopped. If it's at 500 cc's, I stop. If it's at five liters and they have no pain, I don't stop. So it's not a volume issue. It's either a pleural pressure change, which most people don't measure, or a pain issue, which has been shown to correspond with it. And this is what re-expansion pulmonary edema looks like, our sort of greatest fear when I was in training at the University of Washington, Dave Pearson, who's uh, I think the consummate professor used to say, re-expansion pulmonary edema is the Sasquatch of the ICU. We all fear it, but none of us have ever seen it. Uh, the surgeons would disagree with that. They say that it's real, probably more reflects the timing, a lung that has been contracted for a long period of time and then is stretched open versus a lung that's been contracted for a short period of time. But this is what it looks like. It's a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema picture. The ways we can minimize it is, as I showed, stopping if there's pain, but it's also very difficult to predict. David published this paper of 185 patients, all of them having relatively large volume thoracentesis, and only one patient out of the 185 developed through expansion pulmonary edema. They had no change in pleural pressures, and they had less than 1,500 cc's drained. So again, it's difficult to predict. That's why I monitor the patients closely and ask them continuously, are you having any pain? Are you having any discomfort? And using that simple technique, uh, we haven't had any outpatient episodes of re-expansion pulmonary edema. So what are the recommendations? I think that they should be done by ultrasound guidance. I think that people should develop a program, have a central person or a central group that's most interested in this that can be a central referral hub for managing pleural fluid so they get comfortable with doing thoracentesis. 
Drain the maximum tolerated. This is now consistent with the most recent 2018 guidelines. They do not say stop at a particular volume, but I do say stop if there's pain. Uh, and use this for planning, future definitive procedures. If the lung expands by ultrasound or chest X-ray, or if they're lung entrapment, this is how we're going to decide what the next step. So every plural case that I see starts with a discussion and ends with a thoracentesis in that same office visit. So how do we go from there? So if with the thoracentesis there's relief of symptoms, um, then we have to move forward. If there's no relief of symptoms with the thoracentesis, then I don't think people need an intervention. I think it's 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 totally reasonable to not do procedures on people that do not benefit from them. Now we have to be clear on what those symptoms are, meaning did it improve their appetite? Did it improve their sleep? Sometimes patients are unclear that it helped because the pleural fluid reaccumulates very rapidly. And if we're not seeing them for a week, it could have reaccumulated within a day or two. So careful questioning is very important. But let's say that the lung uh, does, fully re uh, does not fully re-expand. Uh, and so what are our options? So fluid is drained, patient feels better, lung does not expand. These are the issues that I showed before that I think that a procedure needs to meet, and I'm going to try to prove to you that a tunnel pleural catheter or an IPC or a pleurex meets these goals. So this is a picture of a tunnel pleural catheter. There's a portion that's outside the patient. There's a portion that's in the pleural space with holes, and then there's a bottle that patients and patients don't usually, but family drain. This has been around since about 2005, 2007, FDA approved, very easy to place, very safe. So is it rapid? Well, here's a study that we published several years ago looking at the length of stay in our patients in comparison to talc pleuridesis. And if you look at the bottom, the mode, which is because we had a large distribution, both inpatient and outpatients, but the mode for a tunnel pleural catheter was zero days, meaning it was an outpatient procedure exclusively. And the um, mode for uh, talc pleuridesis was three days, mean being three days for TPCs and six for talc. The point of this is that for talc pleuridesis, often it required a hospitalization that the TPC is an outpatient procedure. We place it, patients go home. So it's rapid, meets the first criteria. What about risk? So there was a large paper that was published, uh, international trial retrospective. There were over a thousand patients in it. Uh, plural related infections were 50, about 5%. Uh, the majority of them, 38 of the 50, had a complete response to antibiotics. Nine had a chronic infection that required chronic antibiotics, and there were three deaths in the group. The three deaths made up three out of the 50 or 6% of the total infections, but only 0.3% of the total number of patients uh, who had an indwelling pleural device. And in about 62% of the individuals who had an infection, it caused pleuridesis, meaning it scarred the pleural space and you could take it out. The guidelines now don't recommend taking out a tunnel pleural catheter in the setting of infection, treating through it and they are thought to be relatively safe. I counsel people when we put them in that there's about a five to 7% infection rate. But the question that I had was not the overall infection rate. The question that I had is, are we gonna delay medical oncologists wanting to give chemotherapy if we put a foreign device in them? So we did a study that we recently published <clears throat> in 2021, uh, we got an international cohort of patients and over a thousand patients uh, were studied is also a retrospective uh, study. We looked at individuals who had tunnel pleural catheters who were on chemotherapy and then broke them down into groups that were immune compromised on chemotherapy and those that were not immune compromised on chemotherapy. And you'll see that the curves here do not separate. So the upper curves, the dash line or deaths associated, um, and there's really no difference here. But what I want you to look at is the bottom line, which is TPC-related infections. So there was no difference in infections, whether someone was on antineoplastic therapy and was immune compromised, and those that were not on immune, that were not on antineoplastic therapy. So this is, I feel, very compelling data that said we should not delay palliation 
and that if patients are going to get chemotherapy, they can get it with a tunnel pleural catheter, even though we may have a four to five percent infection rate associated with them. There was no difference in these groups. The most important thing is that patients don't delay their treatment. And the most important thing is that we don't delay palliation of their symptoms. And I think that this data is supportive of that. So then people, both patients and providers, always want to know, well, how long does a tunnel pleural catheter have to stay in? So this is the ASAP trial, which was uh, primarily done out of Duke. It was a multi-center prospective trial. I say that pleural catheters can stay in as long as they need to stay in. Uh, there is no need to ever change them. This trial was designed to see if we could affect pleuridesis early. And so the trial was designed so that individuals would drain daily for 10 days. And if you look here, the complete response to da draining daily, meaning they achieved pleuridesis, was higher in the daily group versus the standard care group. So it was 22 out of 73 or 12 out of 76 in the standard arm. The problem with this trial is that if you look down at the bottom two columns, and this is the trial with many malignant pleural effusion trials, is that many people died before the trial end. There were more people that died in the standard care arm. Either way, I think that it's not inappropriate if people wish to see if they can get it out for them to drain daily for about 10 days. But again, I personally don't feel that pleuridesis is the holy grail. I think that palliating symptoms is the holy grail. So this is just one more tool for counseling patients in that shared decision-making conversation, but not essential. What are some complications associated with tunnel pleural catheters? Well, we published this paper early on in our experience with them. And so what this paper shows is that tunnel pleural catheters can get obstructed. We do not need to remove tunnel pleural catheters when they get obstructed, and we do not need to uh, intervene on them with wires or other. We can put all to place in an inf outpatient infusion center similar to ports. We put in four milligrams of all to place. And so what we were able to show here is out of 204 TPCs that we inserted, 18% uh, of them, just around 20% of them uh, underwent, uh, had an obstruction. Uh, we then gave all to place. Um, and uh, about half of those um, with when these obstructions, about 40% of them, they did ultimate pleurides and we removed them. About 10% of them, about 27% of them, about 10 out of the uh, uh, 37 uh, reobstructed and needed all to place again. But we were able to reachieve patency at the time and reinstill the use of the catheter with all interventions. It's safe, it's outpatient. Uh, and uh, I think that this is something that is a real game changer for individuals so that they can continue to palliate their uh, symptoms with the tunnel pleural catheter without removing it and having to replace it. But the final thing is, does it work? Does it help patients? Does it meet our goals? And so this is Alain Tremblay, uh, who's uh, a Canadian researcher uh, who's done a lot of work with tunnel pleural catheters and uh, did some early quality life quality of life uh, data with it. And these are two studies that I'm going to show you here. And these are quality of life questionnaires, which show that actually people have very good or excellent symptom control uh, in, uh, with their tunnel pleural catheters. But more importantly, I think, is this trial which is what they looked at, which was treatment satisfaction. And would you recommend this treatment to someone undergoing the same issue? So treatment satisfaction, 82% and recommendation, 96%. Uh, I think this is compelling data uh, that suggests that patients really receive benefit and feel that others would too. And patients are our strongest advocates for this. So uh, I think a major tool in your tool chest uh, pulmonologists can place them, general surgeons can place them. Uh, I think that it's uh, something to uh, consider in a dynamic program uh, that's easy to establish uh, on the peninsula. So in summary, I think it meets the four standards of procedural palliative care. Um, and they're a patient directive proactive tool. I tell people to drain before they get short of breath. They should not get benefit from draining catheters because they're draining so often. 
It does require a program. It does require a, a supportive uh, a person who can help with uh, resources, uh, managing insurance, uh, and just answering questions. Uh, but I can tell you that patients are enormously appreciative of this service that, uh, in most part, my nurse provides. Quick, quick question. Please, I apologize, please. Apologize yeah. if you've already stated. Nope. What, what type, what type of imaging do you use to go in, or, or do you just uh, go in based on the chest X-ray? Uh, so the uh, the intervention to place the tunnel pleural catheter. Yes. So we place them with ultrasound. So uh, ultrasound uh, is, uh, we initially place these uh, actually even in the office. We don't do that anymore. There was one paper that showed that there was a slightly greater infection rate. We place them uh, in, uh, you can place them in a procedure suite. You can place them anywhere. We do them in the operating room, which is purely just our logistic workflow. Uh, and uh, it's conscious sedation. We place an ultrasound machine. I identify the fluid. I put an X in the intercostal space that corresponds to it clean, numb up, uh, and place it. It's a Seldinger technique to place it. It doesn't require any major incisions. It doesn't require the assistance of fluoroscopy. It doesn't require the assistance of surgery. It is a Seldinger technique procedure that uh, is marked by ultrasound. Really good, thanks. And uh, I can tell you that the procedure to take, I've, you know, and this is where people always brag, uh, you know, uh, but I will tell you that uh, the actual placement of the procedure, uh, I've done it in 11 minutes. So, I mean, it's quick. It's uh, conscious sedation. That doesn't mean getting the patient sedated, getting the patient positioned, but the actual procedure, it's not that much more involved than a thoracentesis. It's a very straightforward procedure. So in summary, uh, uh, I think though that it's not just a procedure, it's a program. We got to have shared decision making with our patients. Is this the right thing? Uh, get family ready for it. Uh, tell them why this is going to benefit them. But again, we use this. It keeps people out of the ED. It keeps them out of the hospital. It keeps them at home. Uh, Actually, I have patients that go to work with them. I have patients that have played golf with them. Uh, so it keeps people active. So uh, I'm a huge fan uh, at all stages of people's uh, journey. Okay, but let's say that the lung does re-expand. Do we have more options? So traditionally, people are familiar with pleuridesis. Uh, that's pretty common out there. Um, again, I'm just showing you the slide to make sure that we remember them. This is the old data that people go on, particularly the surgeons. This is the intergroup trial. It's from 2005, back when pleuridesis was the mainstay of managing this. Uh, and they used talc slurry versus uh, an insufflation of talc into the chest with a uh, camera. Uh, there was no difference between the two. They did do a subset analysis, which the surgeons often point to that say that a VATS uh, talc uh, insufflation is better in the setting of lung and breast, uh, but essentially there was no difference. And this data I think will be important as I show you some later data. The problem with this study is that it's old and they didn't really do great patient selection. There was a high mortality and other issues, but it can be done and it has always been the traditional standard of care. I think it's safer than this study shows. I think this also rep represents a different time and a different patient population. The data and guidelines say that talc is the sclerosin of choice. Uh, the complications of talc are thought to be related to talc particle size. And so uh, the recommendation is less than five grams of talc. The catheter size, if you're going to do it at the bedside, doesn't matter. Uh, 14 French has been used, 12 French has been used. Uh, catheter size is not a major deal as long as you flush it and keep it from being uh, obstructed. Um, but uh, the length of stay associated with uh, pleuridesis is longer than a TPC, and the failure rate is long, uh, higher. It's about 16%, and we're going to go into this a little bit in the next section. Um, and patient selection is critical. I'm not going to say that it's bad. Uh, if talc is successful, there's no pit crew. Uh, they, uh, they don't have to drain a catheter. They don't have anything that requires family to assist them. So again, shared decision making and discussion with the family as long as everyone understands the pros and cons. And we're going to talk about those more. So let's say that uh, you have a TPC or pleuridesis. I just wanted to show you some of the data that was available for pleuridesis alone. 
Now I'm going to show you a little bit more of some comparison data. This is back to our data showing that the reintervention rate for talc was 16%. That means that they didn't really effectively pleurodese, and we had to come up with an alternative solution, whether that was a tunnel pleurocatheter or other. And this is pretty consistent across studies. This is the TIME-2 trial. It's a British trial. It's comparing indwelling tunnel pleurocatheters to chest tubes. Uh, and talc pleurodesis and the ability to relieve dyspnea. They had 106 patients. They used a 12 French catheter and instilled four grams of talc. Um, the primary outcome was dyspnea, and there was really no difference at 42 days in the dyspnea scores. But the secondary outcomes at three months and six months showed that there was a slight favorability for the tunnel pleural catheters. But more importantly, if you look at the 12 month hospitalization, it was one day for the tunnel pleural catheters or indwelling pleural catheters and four and a half days for talc. The answer that I use here with my takeaway is that both of them relieve dyspnea. People may need to go to the hospital a little bit more with talc uh, for different reasons, uh, but uh, it is viable and it does achieve the goal of relieving dyspnea. The complication rate associated with this, pleural infections in the IPCs and some in talc, really not big significant differences, excuse me, in complications or management. So I think both really in this day and age are safe. But this is the most interesting data. You know what, this is what bums me out about research. We had this idea a number of years ago and actually had an IRB protocol and we only enrolled one patient in it and we really weren't able to get it off the ground. The exact same trial here of placing a tunnel pleural catheter, placing talc in the outpatient setting and seeing if they pleurodesed was done by the British group and published in the New England Journal. So if we had just had more study perseverance, I'd be published in the New England Journal right now, but alas. So this is a trial looking at outpatient pleurodesis through a tunnel pleural catheter. Tunnel pleural catheter was placed, talc was placed through it, and they actually had effective pleurodesis over placebo, which was saline. So we can begin to think about combining the two if that's the patient's wish, and we can think about doing it safely and effectively. So I do think our knowledge of how to manage patients is improving. We just have to think about what patients want and how to achieve it. Is pleurodesis the holy grail? That's really going to depend on that conversation with the patient. So here is sort of a little bit of the dark side of palliative care is a little bit of the cost effective data. This is a little bit old. This is Brian Myers group out of uh, Wash U. And so repeated thoracentesis for individuals have a short life expectancy is the most cost effective. And, you know, it's always difficult when you talk about palliative care and hospice to talk about cost effectiveness, but I, I think it is something that we need to acknowledge. Uh, TPCs are next, uh, bedside pleurodesis third, and thoracoscopic pleurodesis is obviously the most expensive. What this kind of data doesn't account for uh, and uh, I think is going to be really important is this is looking at the procedures themselves. It doesn't look at saved ER visits. It doesn't look at in-home days versus in-hospital days. So there are a lot of intangibles, but I do think that they are things that we all need to consider for people at the end of life. But the primary goal are those four issues that I stated. So this is really base level decision making. It's really the patient in front of you, right? So. You know, the individual on the left, this is a patient that if their lung expands, you need to have a conversation about what they want. This is often the young patient with breast cancer, with kids. What meets their lifestyle needs with a malignant pleural effusion? Is it serial thoracentesis coming into the office because it gives them confidence? Is it a tunnel pleural catheter so they can drain it at home? Or do they really want none of that and want to try pleurodesis? The person on the right, you know, they probably have fewer options. We really don't want to put them through an aggressive procedure like pleurodesis. We don't necessarily want them to have a four to six day hospitalization. So again, everything is shared decision making and appropriate conversation. And this is the algorithm that I broke apart to have this discussion and we published in our paper in 2012. And it just walks you through this map 
of all of the different steps that we think are important in shared decision making and decision making, which start with the thoracentesis. Do they have relief of symptoms? Uh, do we move forward with uh, a tunnel pleural catheter, pleuridesis, or a discussion of the two if they have lung expansion? My concluding statements on the malignant pleural effusion is palliation of MPE must be tailored to the individual patient. Some patients remain active despite their diagnosis of malignancy and experience significant loss of function when pleural fluid is present and become once again highly functional when it's evacuated. Again, I have patients that are go to work, patients who do sports, patients who participate with their family uh, with pleural effusion. It is not a condemnation to a decreased quality of life necessarily. I have others that are significantly impaired, uh, but when you remove the pleural fluid, they feel a little bit better. So we need to not set the standard that people play golf. We need to set the standard that people live their best lives. And so the only absolute that I have is that we need to really palliate. So I'm going to go back to that patient. So this patient had metastatic pancreatic cancer. They were uh, getting outpatient thoracentesis. Uh, they were getting them a couple times a week, not by me. This was done in interventional radiology. They had rapid uh, drainage of one uh, side resulting in uh, re-expansion pulmonary edema. And we ended up managing them. The left side was an uncomplicated side, the right side, uh, the lung did expand, uh, even though they ended up having a pneumothorax. Um, and so we placed bilateral tunnel pleural catheters. Uh, they drained pleural fluid on the left. They drained pleural fluid and air on the right. This patient was discharged to home. They lived for three weeks at home. They spent Thanksgiving at home with their family. We had daily contact with them to see how they were doing and they needed anything at end of life. And the family and the patient reported that shortness of breath and management of the pleural fluid, which previously had been their major problem, was not their problem at the end of life. And so three weeks is a long time to spend with your family at home at the end of life. And it's an even longer time if you're sitting in the hospital uh, and it's harder for family to visit. So I really think we need to think about how we manage these patients individually. And all of these are simple interventions that can be done in the community, keeping people at home uh, and keeping people's symptoms in check uh, if, if we follow some fairly simple principles. So I want to end with the show off portion, and then I would like to just have some discussion and, and take some talks, uh, some questions. So that's my section on pleural effusion, and that's where I spent the most time because I hope that you can begin to think of how you can develop an algorithm to palliate people, keep them at home, uh, and uh, create a system so it, the wheel is not invented for each person depending on who they see. But central airway obstruction is something that maybe isn't managed easily in every place, and this is something that we do do. And I wanted to take you through a couple things that we do if this ever uh, is a problem for you that we're happy to help sort out for you. This is why everyone is terrified of, uh, of central airway obstruction and why I don't think it's best managed uh, in an unsupervised setting like an endoscopy unit. This is a patient that we saw who was billed as having central airway obstruction based on their imaging. This is actually the mass that they had, one of the more terrifying masses, a central anterior mass deviating the trachea, significant loss of airway. So it's really uh, not something to be uh, cavalier about. It's something that we need to manage uh, in a really thoughtful and safe fashion. Again, though, we can manage people with it. Uh, I do think that procedures at the end of life, even if people have advanced cancer, is worth it as long as it meets these goals. This is not cancer, but this is a, a common thing that we see, and you may see this in a number of your patients. This is subglottic stenosis. The one on the left is inflammatory. The one on the right is after a tracheostomy. They're managed completely differently, even though they may have the same symptoms. The one on the left, we can easily balloon dilate. 
We stick a balloon in it. It opens up. This is the airway afterwards. They go home. It's an outpatient procedure. It takes about 15 minutes. We do it under conscious sedation. And sometimes we either never see people back or they come back years later. This is the patient that presents in your office with wheezing, shortness of breath. It's not getting better. They have this, uh, you know, they get inhalers oftentimes. And I think it's it's worth considering, although it is a zebra and it's rare. This is the patient that needs to go to surgery. This is a patient that's had a tracheostomy tube. You can see that the posterior membrane is intact so that when we inflate the balloon, all of the pressure of the balloon goes out the posterior membrane and we do nothing to change the deviation in the airway. These are patients that need to go to surgery. So we can help sort these out, guide these patients to where they need, palliate some of them, send others to surgery. What about malignant obstructions? There are three different kinds. There's intrinsic, extrinsic, and a mixture. This is what they look like in the airway. And we can usually palliate these people. It doesn't mean they're not going to go on to need definitive therapy. And we have made improvements. We do rigid bronchoscopy, but this picture I like to show because while we may not have improved our rigid bronchoscopy, we have improved anesthesia. I believe that the anesthesia is provided here by the guy on the right who just has strong hands and holds the guy's neck in place while they stick a sword down it because this is what rigid bronchoscopy looks like. Again, relatively safe, quick outpatient procedure that we do, and we can alleviate obstruction. Here's an obstruction that we saw in a patient. We were able to core it out, cauterize the base. Here's a patient that we ended up putting a stent in because we weren't able to achieve a complete opening because of a more mixed obstruction. We open it up, place the stent in, and you can see now that their airway is less compromised. Majority of these patients will feel better, much harder to predict than pleural effusion because they obviously have a big disease burden, but it's an outpatient procedure. I think it's safe, and I think it's certainly worth trying and not giving up on these patients because shortness of breath and suffocation at the end of life is obviously a very terrifying and horrible way to feel. There are complications from stents. Oftentimes, they can get impacted with secretions. They can get some granulation tissue. A lot of this stuff we can manage. And, you know, this is a patient who has uh, occlusion or uh, loss of volume in the left hemithorax, and they had occlusion of their stent. Uh, and so these are nothing that we do is benign in medicine, and we need to acknowledge that and think about it and figure out what our strategies are going to be for managing it. So here's an obstructed stent of two different varieties. One is a large silicone stent that we placed. One is a, um, a self-expanding metal stent that got obstructed. And so it's important to know what you're going to do, predict potential complications so that you can manage them. Here's uh, an obstructed stent, an obstructed airway that we were able to clean out um, and return the patient to patency. And uh, this was all done in the outpatient setting when the patient had shortness of breath. And with that, uh, uh, I know that everyone has clinic and I didn't wanna run over time. Uh, and I would love to sort of have any discussion that you want. The last part was really just to say, if you do run into central airway obstruction, uh, I wouldn't necessarily give up on these patients. We're more than happy to help, but I think pleural effusion is something that you're gonna run into much more commonly. I think that these patients don't need to travel for something as simple as this, but I also think that creating pathways where individuals enjoy working with patients with pleural effusion will help them build a practice, help them build volume, and help them build a much needed service line, I think, uh, for your community. So, with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and, and getting up so early in the morning. And I would imagine that it's beautiful there as it is here. And if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. Uh, and I appreciate it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Excellent presentation. I'm hospitalist director and practicing hospitalist, and I'm sure that uh, all hospital is seen fair share of pleural effusions, malignant or non-malignant, but uh, 
that's a great idea what we could be doing in the community if we had more resources maybe one day in many many moons we'll get there yeah you know i as a hospitalist i think it's frustrating to see a lot of pleural effusion because honestly i believe that pleural effusion should be managed in the outpatient setting if we're getting a lot of patients in the inpatient setting i feel that personally we have failed in getting our messaging out. So I totally hear you. Um, and it's my hope that we are able to minimize this. And I am um, a, I am one of the, how do I say this politically? I am one of the loudest voices saying that we are under resources, under resourced and need more support. Uh, I think that we are uh, we are really struggling in healthcare in general right now, uh, and and honestly, it's uh, my wife is a former zookeeper, and it's really hard for her to understand. I think actually, she's watched me over the last you know 16 years, and actually become much less um, satisfied with what I do. But that being said, I think really the main resource that you need to start this is an interested pulmonologist, an interested uh, internal medicine doc, an ultrasound machine, uh, and uh, a pathway to refer to them. I do thoracentesis in the office. Uh, we have an ultrasound machine in the office. It's a relatively low volume investment. Uh, I can uh, see a patient, do a consult, drain a pleural effusion uh, in a very short period of time, uh, it does not require all of the support. This is documented in the literature. It's a safe outpatient procedure, ultrasound, drainage. And so if there ever was a, uh, I think the first thing is to, if you have a willing pulmonologist, uh, someone looking to build a uh, volume, looking to build a program, pleural disease is the ideal thing. And all it requires is uh, letting people know, having an ultrasound machine, and then becoming facile at doing it. Uh, and I hope that it will result in decreased admissions because I think you're right. Uh, admissions as a hospitalist for pleural effusion uh, means that we we sort of botched something in the outpatient setting. And it, but it's the one area where I I'm not I don't ask for a lot of resources. Uh, there's a lot of areas I ask for resources. Don't get me wrong, uh, and that's the one area that I don't. But it does require a passionate uh, individual, either uh, 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 an internal medicine doctor who's interested in this, uh, uh, or uh, uh, a pulmonologist. Uh, it's it's very easy, low resource. That's why that's why I really wanted to sort of bring this idea up because. I'm not asking anybody to buy a robot. I'm not telling you, you know, you got to hire four nurse practitioners. Uh, I do this alone. My partner left and went to MUSC. I have an ultrasound machine in the room. I have my own nurse that I've had forever, who I am unemployable without, and that's our program. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, with my partner, we saw 700 last year. Uh, you know, I'll probably see 500 or so, but uh, it, it fits into my day. I can do it. So, uh, and the medical oncologist will call us and say, hey, I've got this breast cancer patient. She's very short of breath. Can we send her over? Uh, once you build it, they will come. Uh, so I do encourage if you're looking at future recruitments or people are looking to build a program, uh, uh, this is uh, me, an ultrasound machine, and my nurse. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's low resources. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Well, that, thank you. That was really good presentation. Thanks. And I cannot see who we have in the audience, but I hope we have some more questions or comments. Well, it's totally fine. I appreciate everyone. And I know everyone has, you know, uh, I know these are, you know, really challenging times uh, for everybody at every level, outpatient, inpatient, uh, and administration. Uh, so uh, I think uh, looking for ways that we can support each other, both medically and non-medically are really important. So I do appreciate this opportunity to meet with you guys and talk and uh, and uh, actually let you know how much I love coming out to the peninsula and where you guys are. I think it's uh, awesome. Uh, so, and I, I, hopefully my email is in the chat. 
if anybody ever wants to get a hold of me or has questions or concerns or wants to talk about a patient, uh, uh, call me, you know, shoot me an email anytime. And, uh, or you can page me or do whatever. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody at any time. Thank thanks you so much, Dr. Gordon. And thanks for a great presentation. Um, thanks for everybody for attending. The CME information is in the chat as well as Dr. Gordon's email. Uh, but also your on-site education folks have all the information also if you need it. Um, and you can always reach out to me with questions as well. I hope everyone has a really good morning. Well, thank I want to thank you. You did a great job of organizing this. You did a great job of actually emailing me because I am not always great at replying and you are always in good spirits and never frustrated with me and that's an enormous uh, skill set most don't have it so thank you very uh, much you're very welcome thanks for doing this I all hope right you guys, you guys take care